everyone again for coming down. Um, before we kick off, just a quick poll. But who is this the very first meetup? Okay, who's been to at least three? Okay. Anyway, next up is Vincent. Uh, so this is actually, I think, first meetup world. So we've got two Belgians. I'm Belgian myself. So many Belgians you come across these days. But. So the second Belgian of the evening, uh, Belgian, uh, is uh, Vincent, who's Chief AI Officer at Sentient. And he's going to talk about uh, learning embeddings with, with spatial meaning. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So if you, if you feel like a, a change of scenery, Belgium is a great country, as you can see. <laughs> um, so today I'm... I'm <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm Vincent. I work at uh, Sentience, which is a, a, an Antwerp startup scale-up. We have about 70 people. It's an AI company. So half of us are data scientists, half of us are data engineers. This is not going to be a company pitch. I'm going to show you one slide. Uh, about what we do, just because then the research part uh, will be put kind of in that in that context. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, self-supervised learning through um, triplet loss networks and applied specifically in this in this case on. I'm going to give other examples too on location data. The idea being that uh, if you think about word embeddings like uh, word word to vector something, um, then you basically want the you, you want to. Ex to represent the fact that words that appear in similar context are, are of similar semantic meaning, right? And the same kind of holds for geographic information. A building, well, it's just a building, but if you see a building in two similar contexts, for example, two times a building with uh, a park or, or a forest next to it and some water around it and a big road in front of it, then, it, then those buildings, whether one is in Belgium and one in Japan, they probably have very similar semantic meaning. So that's, that's something we're going to try to, to encode. Um, so briefly about, about sentience and why we actually did this, this part of research. Um, what we did is we developed a, 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 an SDK, a mobile SDK, that goes into the app of our customers. Once we're in that app, we, tr we start logging um, sensor data, that is accelerometer, gyroscope, measuring the vibrations of the phone, um, and location information. And from that uh, sensor data, we then try to extract behavioral intelligence. Based on the vibrations of the phone, we figure out, or the algorithms figure out, uh, what is your mode of transport? Are you walking, biking, any train, tram, bus, car, flight, stuff like that? What is your home and work location? Which places do you visit? We build a whole timeline, start predicting your next actions. Use that to do intent modeling. This is the second layer here, the moments. So for example, if you're in a car, why are you in a car? Is it, is it your commute? Is it a shopping routine? Is it a, a sports routine? Stuff like that, children drop off. And then we aggregate all of that over several weeks of time, create segments that say who you are. Are you a workaholic? Are you a parent? Are you an aggressive driver, et cetera? So what do we, why do we do this? Um, we do this to coach people to improve their lives. We have a bunch of behavioral psychologists in-house. Um, that, help, that help us create digital coaching programs, for example, to stop smoking or to help people uh, stop using their phone while, while driving. And so what is the business model? Well, we're in several verticals, but of course, insurance companies love this, right? Because if we can help you stop using your phone while driving, or if, you, if we can help you sport more, then you, you need to go to the doctor less or, or there are less claims, risk goes down, everyone is happy. And so that's the, that's the model. All right, now the tech stuff. Um, so. As part of our whole platform, one of the things we need to do is venue mapping. And of course, it's not just specific to Sentience. Think about Foursquare or Google. They all have this problem. Given an inaccurate GPS fix, you want to figure out what place is a person visiting. Um, and in Antwerp, that's quite easy. Here in London, it's a nightmare. You have these huge buildings, at least compared to Antwerp, it's huge. Uh, and, and, and because you don't have line, line of sight with, with all GPS satellites or because of signal uh, reflection, uh, it's kind of called an urban canyon, um, GPS can be way off, right? Sometimes you get a GPS fix, latitude, longitude, that is actually 100 meter further than where you actually are. So that means if, if at that location fix, that the phone gives us, we go to our database, let's say OpenStreetMaps, and we see what's, what's in the neighborhood. OpenStreetMaps is going to say, oh, three meters from your location, there is a bus stop. But if you're there in the middle of the night for five hours in a row, you're probably not visiting the bus stop, right? So you're probably visiting like the nightclub 100 meters further. So you need some, some logic there. You need a classifier or that looks at everything that is in a certain radius and ranks it according to some common sense, to some, to some logic. Um, OK. So um, how, does this, how does this roughly work um, at Sentience? Well, imagine this example. So the person is here in, in the middle. 
we have uh, the red circle is kind of a, a covariance matrix, uh, just a, a, a confidence interval um, where the person might also be. That is kind of derived from the from the satellite uh, information. Um, so what we do is we retrieve all the venues in the red circle, and those are all candidates of where you might be, right? Um, and then each of those blue icons here in the circle, so each of those venues, like one is a shop, one is a, a gas station, whatever, each of those uh, we describe with a feature vector. For example, uh, simply uh, some kind of, of encoding of the type. A sh uh, let's say a one-hot encoding that, that shows is it a shop or a gas station or something. Yeah? Maybe the, the opening hours of the place, uh, like a, a whole bunch of, of features. And then there are also some global cluster features that just say in this, in this cluster, how, how many times, let's say, last nine weeks or something, have you visited the place? What is the average uh, or the most popular day that you come here? Is it a Monday or, or a Sunday? Yeah? Um, <coughs> And so, so you have the, the cluster features and, and the, the venue specific features, they get concatenated. And then basically each of those venues with a, with a full feature vector is classified separately. So you get a probability for each of them and then you rank them and you take the most likely one. That's roughly how the, how the venue mapping uh, today works. And our classifier is actually simple random for us today. Um, okay, so it works pretty okay. But what we see is that when it makes a mistake, it's very often mistakes that humans would never make, um, even if you would simply look at a map. So, so, so obviously it misses some, some, the classifier misses some common sense. If you see here, for example, huh, the user is at this location, well, the venue mapper is gonna say, he's probably at a lifeguard station. But we know that if the person is here for two hours in a row, he's probably just relaxing on the beach, right? He's not visiting a lifeguard station, who does that? So, so you need some, some I mean, it might be, but it's unlikely. So you need some way to introduce a kind of, of common sense just by, by, by looking at, at the map, by encoding how the environment looks like. And you need also a way to generalize this, to make sure that if you learn that for, for this place, which is in the US, that it also works for, for a beach in Japan, right? Um, so one step towards that uh, was this idea where we actually clustered the whole world, the whole OpenStreetMap map database into overlapping clusters um, of, of region types. Um, this is Antwerp, and so the, the, whole, the whole green area here is the world famous shopping street, the Mer. You must, have, you must visit it. Um, the, the blue area here, there, there, there are, that's where the students go, a bunch of drinks and there are restaurants. And so that already, if, if, you, if you now get a location, again, you can get a, like a one hot encoded vector of which, which region types are active there. It's a start, but it doesn't solve the complete problem. So because you're still dealing with predefined hard uh, clusters. So we want a more fuzzy um, representation, a more, a more um, distributed representation of, of the environment. So that's how we arrived to the idea of uh, log to vec. Just a second. I'm trying to keep an eye on the timing. Um, okay. So what do we do with log to vec? <coughs> we start with uh, latitude longitude here. We rasterize it into an let's say an image tile, so that you actually have a piece of a map of open street maps. Um, I'm going to explain more later, like why it's not one image tile, but several layers. Uh, once you have an image tile, and, and while, why we actually do that rasterization, because you might also skip that. But once we rasterize it, you, need, you want some kind of neural network or some kind of mechanism that then encodes it into a low dimensional feature vector, into an embedding, just like word to vec that you, that you can then um, do cool stuff with. And, and, and ideally, it needs to be, um, the embedding needs to be embedded into a metric space. I'm going to go a bit deeper into that. But, but one of our main problems is that for venue mapping, we don't have a lot of labeled data. And it's very difficult to get labeled data. You cannot easily ask millions of people to start labeling every place they visit. Um, so, so you want to train a classifier with very small amounts of, of labeled data. And it has to work whether, he, again, this person goes to Japan or to Belgium or to the US or, or wherever. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why we, why we want this uh, this self-supervised learning system. So um, again, the metric space. Why a metric space or what is a metric space? Well, very, very quickly, you just want uh, some space where distances are well-defined. In our case, we want a Euclidean distance. So you want to be able 
between points in the embedding space to uh, calculate the distance such that the distance is symmetric. So distance between A and B is equal to distance between B and A. Uh, the triangle equality holds, meaning the distance between, between A and B um, cannot be uh, or must be shorter than the distance between A and B if you go via a point C, right? Um, and non well, the distance is always positive. Um, so you can actually look at, look at this as some kind of manifold learning, right? Um, you, 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 want to, you want some kind of self-supervised manifold learning, traditionally completely unsupervised. You probably use um, Tizni to, to visualize stuff or maybe isomaps or, something, or some form of, of manifold learning. Uh, this is what we want to do here, um, but in a self-supervised way so that we can actually, if you, if you plot something with Tizni or you reduce dimensionality with, with uh, isomaps, you don't have control over how, the, how your uh, space will look like, whether it will even be a metric space, right? Um, and here we want a way to actually steer how, how, the, how, the, how the space looks like. And we want actually to end up with something like this, so we can say, just like with word to vec where you say the word, uh, the, the, the famous example of the, the embedding of the word king minus the embedding of the word man plus the embedding of the word woman is then an embedding that is closer to the word queen, right? You want, to do, you want to be able to do something similar just to prove that you have a decent, uh, uh, well-behaved space uh, with, with our embeddings. You want to get the embedding of this image, and this is a real example, it actually works, at the embedding of an image from a park somewhere else in the world, and you get an embedding for which the closest image is a place somewhere in the world where you have both a bunch of buildings and a lot of green, right? So, so that's, that, that's, the, that's the goal. So, um, yeah, why representation learning in this case? Indeed, because we have very limited amounts of labeled data. Um, you're dealing with unstructured data. If you don't rasterize your data to image tiles, then how are you going to encode all this information? There might be, you want to encode that there is a bridge in the neighborhood, there are, there are some bars in the neighborhood, there is some water, what kind of water? There, like, if you, if you would have a look at OpenStreetMaps, it's, it's a huge amount of information that is in there um, with a whole bunch of spatial relations also. How do you encode that in, a, in an easy way? That would be a, a big amount of manual feature engineering if you wouldn't decide to just rasterize it and feed it into a CNN or something. Um, no. <clears throat> so why not just manifold learning? Again, because we want to be able to control how the space looks like. Huh? Here on the left side, you see from the doc page of scikit-learn uh, uh, an isomap representation of, um, of MNIST. Well, so it's all nice, eh? it's, it's a nice 2D space, and, and you have your clusters, but if you look at um, the distance between one and, where is one? Well, two and three are close to each other, uh, but then four is here at the top and five is somewhere else, so there is no, there is no, the distance is purely based on, on, how, on how the digits look like and how, how MNIST uh, tries to uh, de detect, detect its manifold. What if you want to somehow steer that? You want to make sure that the clusters of fours is closer to the clusters of threes than it is to the cluster of ones. So that is basically what you, what you want to achieve. Um, and another thing, another thing you could do is use a, a variational autoencoder or something. But again, there also, how do you make sure that your autoencoder doesn't just learn to compress your data? You want to make sure that it learns clusters such that clusters that are semantically similar are closer to each other than clusters that have nothing to do with each other. Um, so first, uh, the the rasterization step. So, um, how do we do this? Well, we start with OpenStreetMaps, which is open. Um, we load it up into a Postgres database. Uh, we install the PostGIS extension, after which you can easily um, use some, yeah, some SQL uh, SQL extensions to, to, to query your data. Um, and then we put uh, a Mapnik rasterizer on top of that. Mapnik is also open source. We, uh, we edited the library a little bit to our needs. But um, basically, if you go to OpenStreetMaps Orc, I think it is. Um, the, the maps you see then, just like Google Maps, eh, are rasterized with Mapnik. So we use that same system um, to come up with our uh, rasterization. We made some changes, para parameterized uh, the, the, the library here and there, so that, for example, here, this is all rasterization of the same location, but we changed it a bit so that we can easily introduce uh, offsets, shifts, um, some random rotations, 
of, of, of the world, basically, um, that will come in handy later for uh, data augmentation purposes. Um, another ex important change we did is we don't want RGB rasterizations. Why not? Because in the original uh, Postgres data, you actually nicely have your buildings separated from your roads and separated from, uh, from the land areas. So why would you all merge that together again and then hope that, or, or and then expect the neural network to, to segment it back, to, to, to separate it again? Um, that doesn't make sense. So what we actually do is we rasterize different types of information, buildings, roads, land use, on different layers, different channels. So you don't have a three-dimensional RGB image. Instead, you have a 12-dimensional image or tensor uh, where each channel represents a different type of information. The first channel is still a complete rasterization where everything is put together. Why? Because there is some Z ordering that you miss otherwise. Imagine you have a bridge over, over a road or a water or something. Uh, you, in the separate images, you wouldn't really see that, that at some point uh, something might be above another road and at some po point it goes beneath another road. So there is some complicated set ordering. Um, so for that, the first image is still a, a complete rasterization. Um, okay, so then why, why the triplet loss? We're going to come to the whole triplet loss uh, in, in the neural network definition. But first, why would we even need that? You could say, well, I mean, we can measure the similarity, let's say, between those two images by calculating a histogram and comparing them, right? Well, actually, in this case, although indeed, and I, of course, selected them because of this, but although their histograms are almost identical, um, they're not semantically identical. This, the, left, the left image here is actually clearly uh, some kind of, of well, small secondary road, but that maybe connects different villages, while the, the right image here is a bunch of small roads that leads to people, people's houses, right? Again, if you're going to go venue mapping, that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very different semantic, uh, semantic meaning. So just using histograms is not ideal. Um, also, I mean, you have these, uh, these, these many channels. Um, so would you, would you create several histograms, one for each channel, and then, and then weigh them differently when, when calculating the histogram similarity? Or would you create one high dimensional histogram, which will be very sparse, so a lot of problems there that you probably can overcome, but again, we didn't want to bother with all the manual uh, feature engineering there. You could use other approaches like uh, histogram of orient gradients or some more traditional approaches, but again, uh, you, would, you would have to do a whole bunch of manual stuff for different things for different channels. Um, we, it, can be, it can be quite cumbersome. So we just want to use, we, want, we actually want to train a network to Extract or to learn to extract the features we need instead of us spending weeks or months on defining the right features. So the representation learning. What what is what is the idea of triplet loss? Well, imagine you start with a, an embedding space. Uh, so let's say that the, the I don't know the, the the second to last layer of your neural net or something um, that looks like this. Initially, completely random. You want to end up with with a with a with a embedding space where the anchor image, and the anchor image is, is the image you want to you wanna calculate um, semantic similarity to. Let, let me give you a concrete example. There is this paper already quite old from Google called um, FaceNet. And what they did there is, is, they also use triplet loss. What they did there is they say, OK, we want to learn an embedding where people's, where, where, where similar faces are close to each other and dissimilar faces are far from each other. And then you end up with some kind of few shot learning or few shot classification framework because you can just say here is a face, calculate the distance to another face, and if it's small enough, it's actually you, you have face recognition, right? So what you would do here in, in the training is the anchor image would be my face, a positive image would be another face of my, another picture of my face, and the negative uh, image would be your face, right? And you want the network to, to, to learn and to transform this embedding space so that after training, well, the embeddings of my, my face pictures are very close to each other and far away from your face, unless we, we look like each other. Um, so uh, we just define the, the we, we, we just say that the Euclidean distance in our case between the anchor and the positive must be smaller than the Euclidean distance between the anchor and the negative. 
how does that or why does that actually work? A very, a very simple uh, or simply uh, simplified example here. Imagine you have kind of, let's say you have two faces. We have my face and your face. Um, and, and several pictures, three of mine and three of yours, and we, we add a bunch of, of, um, of constraints. This is a semantic similarity. Imagine we say, well, the distance between x1 and x2 has to be smaller than distance between x1 and x5, and, and a, a bunch of others. So let's, let's first try to satisfy the first two, const uh, well, this constraint and this one. If we draw an embedding space like this, then those constraints are, are satisfied. So that's fine, yeah, because the distance between one and two is smaller than one and five, right? So if we lay it out like this, then here both constraints are satisfied. satisfied. Now we add another constraint, and we get, okay, it's still satisfied. Now if we add the last constraints here, suddenly we have to change the embedding like this to keep satisfying the constraints. So what, what happens during triplet loss training, you don't really have constraints, of course, but you're going to try to constantly optimize all these, all these distance relations. And, and if your mini batch is big enough, and that's actually a disadvantage of triplet loss, you need a big mini batch so that all these interrelations uh, can, can, can be enforced together, then you, you force your neural network oh, sorry, to learn an embedding space. Oh, sorry. to learn an embedding space or to arrange your data in such a way that, that, your, that your constraints or soft constraints uh, hold. Okay, so um, in our case, of course, unlike FaceNet where you have labels, this is my face or this is your face, uh, in our case we, did, we don't have labels. What are, what, are, what are our labels? We don't have that. So how do we define whether something is an anchor image or a positive image or a negative image? So this is the anchor, this is the positive, this is the negative. This is the anchor, positive, negative. Of course, always here, if you see an image, remember that I just show a color image. In reality, it's this 15 channel, or no, 12 channel tensor. Huh? It's, not, it's not an RGB image. Um, but how do, we, how do we define those positives and negatives if we don't have labels? Well, there is this Tobler's first law of geography. It's, it's, I don't know if it's really a law, but it kind of makes sense. That says everything that is geographically closer to each other um, is probably more related than everything that is far away from each other. So although it's definitely not always going to be true, on average, you might say if you take an image tile at a certain location as, a, as your anchor, and you take an image tile at the same location but shift it and rotate it a whole bunch as your positive, and then you take a random image tile, I mean, an image tile of random locations somewhere in the world as a negative, then that is, that is probably a something that, that makes sense. Because indeed, uh, these two, for example, they are, they are the same location. It's just that this one is shifted like 80 meters and rotated, whatever, 60 degrees. Um, so indeed, those two are, are more related than this one and this one. And you want a neural network to learn that. Um, yeah, also, why, why triplet loss? Why not, for example, a, Sy a Siamese network, which is, which is a more traditional uh, approach? It is, I think, you, you could, I didn't try, but the thing is with the Siamese network is you have two inputs instead of three, and you, you just say, okay, these two are related, or these two are not related. The thing is, I cannot say that do this, those are related. I can only say that they are more related compared to, the, to, to this one with the negative one. So, so you want this comparison. You don't want to say the, these two are semantically similar, no, but they are more similar than, than the other two. So, and that actually helps, uh, helps the training. Um, Okay, so you end up with, well, one network with shared parameters. It's not three networks, of course. Um, you feed your positive, your anchor, and your negative into the network. You get your embedding, embeddings of each of those three. And then what we do is we calculate the distance between anchor and positive during training. Uh, we calculate the distance between anchor and negative. And we actually want to maximize uh, this distance and want to minimize this distance. Ideally, you want the distance between anchor and positive to be like maybe zero or close to zero, and the distance between anchor and negative to be maybe infinite or something, right? But to bound it to, to a zero one domain, we put it through a softmax, and we just make sure that we, we actually want this to be zero and this to be one. So our actual loss then becomes a simple mean square error with the vector zero one. And that's, and that's, and that's, that's how we train the network. Um, there is one 
small addition though. The problem if you do it like, just like this is that the network is gonna converge very, very quickly and it's not gonna lurch, learn a lot of interesting stuff. Why not? Because um, usually the distance between, usually this is very easy to optimize because the distance between anchor and negative is, is usually indeed much bigger than anchor and positive. So you have to make it the problem a bit harder for the network. And, and one way to do that is, is hard negative mining. There are a whole bunch of papers uh, that, that dive into that, how to do it efficiently. Really trying during, during the training, every, for every mini batch, trying to find, um, actually putting them through your network, seeing which ones are, let's say putting several negative candidates through the network, seeing which of those candidates are cl quite close to your positive one, and then using that one to train in the next mini batch. So that's, that's something like hard negative mining, but it's slow and it's, it's a bit cumbersome to implement. There is a, another way um, that actually worked quite well for us, and that is um, something called soft PN loss. What the idea here is just that um, you're still gonna just um, minimize distance between anchor and positive, so this one, uh, anchor and positive. But instead of just maximizing distance between anchor and negative, you're gonna calculate the distance between anchor and negative and also positive and negative, and you're gonna maximize the minimum of that. Basically you're saying, I don't want uh, an embedding space where the negative is far away from the anchor. You're gonna say I want an embedding where the negative is far away from the anchor and from the positive one. So that, so that makes it actually harder for, for, the, for, the, for the network because this one would already, co would already satisfy our first, uh, our first proposal because indeed the positive is closer to the anchor than the negative is. But now with our new loss function, it's not good anymore because the negative is way too close to the positive one, right? So it's, it's, gonna, it, it's gonna make it more difficult and, and the learning actually improves. Um, the structure of, of the neural network is nothing to be proud of. It's actually quite, it's, it's already yeah, a year old, which is huge in our domain, right? Um, fun thing is, I'm gonna come back to that later, there is a, an open source PyTorch implementation. Someone, someone decided to implement all of this based on our blog post, um, and this guy did a lot of improvements. Uh, so instead of a traditional VGG-like architecture, he used, uh, I think, a ResNet uh, architecture. It's PyTorch, which might, might also be an improvement over Keras, I don't know. Um, he did, a, well, we'll come back later to it. He trains much faster, like in a few days instead of weeks. Um, anyway, our architecture here, maybe some peculi peculiarities um, apart from the typical stuff. So batch norm is there, dropout is there. Uh, we have a whole bunch of small filters. So we, we quickly go to a lot of channels, but very, very, very small filters. Huh? Um, we use leaky railus. That's maybe an interesting one. Why? Because we, we saw that a lot of our railus were dying. So during, during training, some big, big gradient updates cause, uh, cause big negative biases to be learned. And then because of the, the, the way it really works, the output is, is always zero. So your, your gradient afterwards doesn't do anything anymore. And the ReLU is just the, stop learning, right? Um, so the leaky ReLU actually in a negative part of the ReLU definition doesn't, is never zero. So there is a small slope. And that helped, that helped avoid those, those, uh, those dying ReLUs. Then maybe this is also interesting, the spatial dropout. We actually wanted to avoid our network. We wanted to, to make, it, make sure it generalizes. So one, one thing that helped there is spatial dropout, which is you, you don't drop, let's say, in cross-channel direction a single pixel. Instead, you drop a whole channel. So with a 10% with a chance, and we have 12 channels, here we just, for every, during every, every mini-batch, every epoch, we just drop a whole channel. Um, and that actually forces the network to not be over-reliant on maybe the, the, the channel that, that has all the roads on it or all the buildings or something. So it has to distribute its, its attention, basically. Ah, yeah, and then maybe the, this one, so the embedding layer is actually, you could use just the output of the dense layer uh, because here there is still a nonlinearity, a ReLU. Here, this is just a linear layer. And the reason is mainly because the output here, because of the ReLU, is all in the positive domain. We wanted our embedding, our, ve our feature vector to contain, to be the, the full, uh, the real domain, full, both negative and positive. So there is a small linear transformation here to get, to get that output. Um, training data. Um, so we just, using our demo app, uh, we have a whole bunch of users that visit places. We take those places, actually, in this, I can go come back to this, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip this for now. Um, apart from the fact maybe that I trained for two weeks, on AWS while I was on holiday and when I came back it kind of worked, it's always cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. some, some fun visualizations. Um, 
nothing. I mean, nothing to 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 put too much uh, credibility in or something. But while training and playing around and debugging, it's always nice to 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 visualize this kind of stuff. That's, for example, how we found the dead railus. I will come back to that. But what I did here is, I think, for the first layer in the neural net, actually, um, just show the after it trained for a while, show the output activations of all those filters, given a certain input image. Hoping that at least it would not all be pure noise or that they would all look the same or something. So it does look indeed like um, some filters, like this one. Uh, this one seems to focus really on the, on the big road here, uh, so the primary road and also the secondary road, right? If you look at an another, another filter here, uh, yeah. So well, so this one actually focused on all the roads, even the, even the small tertiary road here. The second one kind of ignores the tertiary road, right? Or it puts less attention on it. Uh, this one, yeah, you cannot really see it, but focuses a bit also on the buildings. Uh, here it's all about, or this one actually does not put a lot of attention on the, uh, the, the grass area here, and the, I think this is beach or something, I, I don't, I'm not sure what this is. Uh, and here it's all about, or it's not about, the land area. So at least you see that, here it's all the buildings, you see that uh, the, the different filters seem to get activated by uh, different parts of the image. It's already, that's, that doesn't prove anything, but it's, it's a good indication. Second thing we did is try to visualize some filters um, <clears throat> just by starting with a, an image of random noise and considering those pixels as the parameters which you then optimize using gradient descent to get the maximum activation at each of your filters. And then, of course, remember again that the input of our, of our, to our neural net is a 12-channel image. So to visualize that, I then just did a PCA to reduce it to three channels and consider those to be RGB, right? That's what you see here. Um, and so, well, again, it doesn't show much apart from maybe that those low-level filters seem to focus on, like, very um, detailed structure, small blobs, small uh, lines, or, or which, which could maybe be edge detectors for roads and stuff like that, while the, the, the filters in the next levels seem to compose those features into bigger uh, structures like blobs and, and stuff. It's just, again, fun to look like. And what we saw is that some of those filters here, at some point, I, I don't have a visual of this, but were completely noise. So you had these fancy colors, and some of them were just full noise. Um, completely random. Uh, and that actually is how we discovered these uh, dead relus. And then retraining with a leaky, leaky relu uh, solved that problem. Um, what, what we see here is our, so the, the, net, the network is trained. We put our test data uh, through our uh, network, end up with a whole bunch of embeddings, do PCA on them. I think our embeddings were 16D or 32D, can't remember. Uh, reduce them with PCA and, um, and visualize the images that correspond to those embeddings. And so what you see is that indeed the network learned something because uh, here you have your, uh, all the, the um, tertiary roads, then you go to the prime, secondary roads, the primary roads, uh, here are the highways. For the rest there are not a lot of buildings here and, and, uh, and then here you have the parks. And then the more you, you move like to the bottom, the busier it gets. Here you have the city centers uh, here you have the touristic areas, you have some beaches, here you have like the, the suburban areas. So, so it, the whole space, as far as you can see that in 2D of course, but there seems to be a, a, a semantic structure in it, like, that, 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 that makes sense, right? Here we have the same, the same thing but then with Tizni instead, uh, instead of PCA. Um, it looks cooler but it's more, it's dif more difficult to actually see anything on it. Uh, this is also a fun one. So what, what, what we also did is, because one part of the, part of the reason we did it is, is indeed for our venue mapper. Eh? We want to train our venue mapper with those embeddings as a feature vector together with our other features. It will still be a random forest, but that's like one extra feature vector. And doing so indeed increased the venue mapper with like five to 10%, depending on the venue types, something that we hadn't been able, like for, 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 for a year before that, we have been gradually improving our venue mapping solution by manual feature engineering. Got a percentage here and there. We spent weeks with like 12 people labeling data, another 2%. And then this solution just pushed, pushed it up a lot. So that, that's great. But we also wanted to know, can it be used for other stuff? One of the things we do is transport mode classification, right? Based on the vibrations of the phone, accelerometer and gyroscope, uh, we, we classify your, your activity mode, walking, biking, etc. So we wanted to know, 
would it make sense to not only look at accelerometer and gy gyroscope, but to also add those location embeddings as a feature vector? Um, and so what, what we did here is, there is no sensor data involved here, but from all the, the trajectories, or from a whole bunch of trajectories we have, and, and we know the label, it was labeled manually, like all the car trajectories, the walking trajectories, uh, we calculate those embeddings, and then we just uh, do um, uh, linear discriminant anal analysis on it. So just a, a, a simple linear projection, and what you see is, of course, because it's, it's a simple linear projection, it's, it's, it's not a classifier yet, but you see that, uh, indeed, biking and tram and train already gets separated quite a lot, purely based on a self-supervisedly learned location embedding space. So that, that also shows that it, that it can be useful for a lot of things. Something else I did here is, um, this is London, and for all the locations that we had in our test data in London, so these are all places visited by people in London that, that are in our test data, um, again, calculate the embedding, and the log-to-vec embedding, we end up with a 32-dimensional embedding. Again, use PCA to reduce it to 3D and consider that RGB. So, and then I plot those colors here on the map. So what you see is that apparently uh, all the locations here in the city center get an embedding that are all greenish, whatever that means. Like, but there, there is some, some semantic, so it, the, the network knows that location here and the location here, although uh, kil kilometers apart, they are semantically similar. And then you have like maybe, I don't know, the water areas or something, and then you have like the, the suburban area. And, and so, so, it, so, so the network learns this, this geographic uh, or semantic consistency. Here you see, I think it was Birmingham. Um, you see that the city, and, and I use the same colors here. So you see that here the city is semantically quite different from London. The city center seems smaller, the, the suburban area seems bigger. I don't know much about the city actually, but that's, Tell me if, if it's wrong. Um, yeah, but it's another indication that, that there is something useful in it. Um, what you see here is, again, not proof. I will get to some proof at some point. <laughs> but uh, it's also a cool visualization just of a random walk in this embedding space. You start with, with a, a random embedding, and then you jump to the closest one, and from that one to the next one, etc. You do like a random walk, and you visualize always the image, and you get this kind of animation. So that you, so that we can see if, if at least the, 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 the manifold is kind of smooth and, and there, there's no crazy stuff in it. Um, you can interpolate. So we start with, with one embedding. We want to end up with another embedding. We just do linear interpolation. There are better ways to interpolate, but... And for each interpolated example, we search the nearest image in our test set. Um, and you indeed see that you gradually can go from one uh, semantic location to another. Again, one might be in Belgium and one might be in Japan, but you see that it learns the semantics. Okay, you can do calculus. I'm gonna skip some of those. I already showed one. So, honorable, honorable mention. If you if you are interested in using this for something, I mean, you, there is there is much more you can do than than um, than what I just showed you. I will give you another example also. But there is this guy that um, and he created a whole blog post of it that re-implemented our solution and did a whole bunch of improvements, really great improvements. One is, of course, instead of using the VDG architecture, he used uh, ResNet, which already makes it much easier to train. Your loss function is, or, or your loss surface is much smoother, um, so training time goes down. He um, used a pre-trained network, which, which surprised me, because, I mean, you're dealing with vector images, which are nothing like ImageNet, uh, but it helped. It, it, again, took the training, uh, training time down a lot, um, and indeed, there are also papers that show that Pre-training on nat natural images also sometimes help with medical images and stuff, so I guess there is something in it. Um, uses PyTorch instead of Keras. Well, no comment on that. Um, this is also a fun, a fun thing he did. Um, so at Sentience, we started with check-in data, right? Places visited by users. If you want to reproduce this, yeah, you probably don't have that check-in data. So how can you do this? Well, what this guy did is um, he randomly picked, he randomly generated uh, image tiles, and then just looked at the file size, how, how many kilobytes or whatever that image tile is. And, and well, an image tile that only contains ocean is gonna be very small, very well compressed. An image tile in the, in the, in the city center is gonna be much bigger, it's not very compressed. If you, and because if you just randomly sample, everything is gonna be in the ocean, right? Um, so he just created histograms of those file sizes and then resampled his training data 
well, using those histograms to make sure you have as many roughly like, like certified, certified, certified sampling, you have as many city centers as oceans. That's a cool, a cool tweak. Uh, mixed precision training, so introduce mixed precision training where you do some of your um, uh, backward pass with um, 16 instead of 32 bit floating points. Less memory requirements, smaller machine needed, much cheaper, um, and it trains faster. He actually did hard negative mining, he found a, an implementation online and, and, and reused that one. Um, well, it's, and, and, and some other things, but in, in any case, it trains 10, 10 times faster. So um, yeah, it's cool to check out, the code is available. Um, yeah, maybe some, some, one last thing to mention, time is almost running out. Uh, about one month after we published our blog post, another paper com came out titled tile to vec which is a much cooler name than lock to vec should have thought about it. But, um, and they do actually pretty much the same thing, but instead, on, on, instead of doing it on vector images, they actually do it on uh, hyperspectral images. Um, so uh, it's, it's basically a remote sensing problem, and uh, they, they take their anchor image nearby, no, so here anchor image nearby, they take a positive image, farther, further away a negative image, and they, they do the same thing, and they, they basically um, convert those real images instead of vector images to the two embeddings. And then they show several things. One is they show that um, on, on a classification problem, a land use or a land cover classification problem, if they just slap a simple logistic regression, a simple linear, linear, linear layer or a classifier uh, on top of those self-supervised learned embeddings, then it actually works much better than if you would do that on top of an autoencoder or, or, or something else. So what we said initially, that the manifold learning, like an autoencoder or, or like an isomap or whatever, that, you, that, that it just learns a compression, you cannot steer this, this semantic distance, um, that indeed seems to be true, right? Because by, by defining that distance, uh, the accuracies go up. Um, something else he showed, let me double check. Yeah, something else he showed, and that is also important for, for the sentience use case, is that, of course, the number of labeled examples you need is much lower than if you go for a fully supervised uh, learning problem. So here hey, he, has, he has his self-supervised embeddings and a simple logistic regression on top of it. Um, his self-supervised or a tri triplet loss trained network was actually a ResNet, so not, not a VGG like ours, but a ResNet, uh, that was identical to this ResNet. But this one was, tra was trained fully supervised in a su fully supervised way, and the others here also. And so you see that, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of labeled data, that you still get quite good results by simply using self-supervision. And again, you, you can use that in many domains. In, in, in video, you can say, okay, uh, uh, you know that the next video frame is very related to the current video frame, much more than, than the video frame 10 seconds from now. That kind of information you can usually use to, you don't have to go for unsupervised learning, you, you don't always need supervised learning. That's the, that's the, the strong suit of the, of the self-supervised self part. Um, another paper that, uh, that cites our blog post um, where they actually calculate in a similar way embeddings, but in, in this case not only of vector images and not only of real images, but they combine it. So, because what they, what they actually wanna, wanna do is they wanna have a, an easy way of giving some real images on the street, figure out where on the map that person is without, without actual uh, GPS coordinates or something. Um, so yeah, they, they, they uh, did a bunch of experiments there, showed that it works quite well. So this one is interesting actually, because what they did here is, there is, a other, there is another paper, so like the state of the art here, is called a BSD, or they, they refer to to it as a BSD approach, and that is, there they actually did a whole bunch of manual feature engineering. They actually trained several detectors to, to detect building sizes and gaps in the buildings and, and I don't know what, and, and that was all used uh, for this uh, root classification problem. And so they showed that their fully self-supervised approach uh, indeed, not apart from the fact that it's much easier, you don't have to do the, the, the feature engineering, but indeed it also works better. Okay. So um, that's it. I would love to, to answer the questions. Thank you.
Uh, just a, a simple question of uh, um, in terms of your embedding space. Um, why me a metric space instead of a, a normal RK or kind of uh, just real space? Sorry, can you, re can you repeat that? Is there any reason to choosing a uh, metric space instead of a, a normal RK? Instead of? Instead of just a normal um, uh, real space, for example. Well, so it's, the, the domain is called metric learning. If you, look for, if you, if you Google for metric learning, there, there's, there, there's a lot of interesting literature. Um, but maybe it's a bit uh, a strong definition because we never actually make sure that it's a metric space. It doesn't maybe matter that much either. But what matters is that you actually usually have well-defined distances that your linear algebra sometimes works. I mean, in the end, it's still going to be input to another classifier, which will have non-linearities, and it, it, it will learn to deal with those imperfections. So if there's a question, indeed, it's although it's called metric learning, there is nowhere there's nothing that guarantees really that you're learning a metric space. But you learn, I mean, I, I'm an engineer, not a mathematician, so you learn a metric-ish space, let's say. <laughs> okay, um, so you said that you use like temporal information f to help with the localization. Was that as part of one of the 15 channels or was that um, later on in your algorithm? Um, no, so are you referring to, to this? Or oh no, your ours. No, so for, for the venue mapping, indeed, we use temporal information, but that's a completely separate um, uh, classifier that uses all kinds of different features, manually engineered features. Um, and since a year now, some of those feature vectors come indeed from, from this one, eh, from the representation learning. Uh, some come from um, temporal encoders that, 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 that encode like people's temporal behavior and feed that into the venue mapper. So there are a whole bunch of, so the, the, the venue mapper itself is still a random forest, but the input um, is, is indeed coming from a whole bunch of different neural networks. Encoding. Some, some encode temporal behavior, some encode social dynamics, some encode uh, geographic information like this one. Hello, hello. Yeah, it works. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, great, uh, great talk. I have a question in terms of uh, the training time. You mentioned two weeks on, on AWS, right? So disclaimer, I, I work at Google. Have you tried uh, TPUs to actually uh, train on the embeddings and all the stuff with, uh, with the images? Because that's, that might be an interesting exercise as well to try. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I would love to, <laughs> okay. but uh, no, so I mean, we, the, we, the whole company runs it on AWS. Um, and because of that, we, they also, they're very supportive of startups, so you get credits and stuff like that. Um, so kind of stuck to, to uh, I mean, and I don't complain about AWS, but indeed I would love to play around with TPUs. Yeah.